Every cop has their share of crazy stories, but this one is definitely the highlight of my career. Back in the 80s, I was an officer in the Bridgeport Police Department. It's an industrial center on the coast of Connecticut. It's not a massive metroplex like Dallas or New York City, but it's big enough to have its share of crime. I worked in the North End, up toward the border with Trumbull in a residential area. Lots of duplexes and triplexes there, so there were more families than you would think based on the housing. The thing about being a neighborhood cop is that at least back then, we got to know the people. There was always somebody good to give you gossip and a lot of time. That kind of connection helps you keep the peace better than anything the force tells you to do nowadays. My favorite neighbor, actually she was everybody's favorite neighbor, was Mrs. Belinsky. She was a sweet elderly woman in her 80s who owned a triplex in the middle of the block. She didn't have family close by, so everybody looked out for her. Mrs. Belinsky baked the best cookies, which she always had ready for me on Tuesday when I stopped by. She would smile and chat, and I'd make sure she didn't need anything before I kept going on my patrol. Fortunately, she lived in a pretty quiet neighborhood, so there weren't many problems. Sure, there was the occasional drunk neighbor, especially on Saturday nights, or maybe there was a loud party every once in a while, but I never got a call to go to Mrs. Belinsky's place. Until the night I did. The call didn't come from her, it came from a neighbor. Like I said, everybody loved Mrs. Belinsky and made sure that they looked out for her. So when the neighbor lady heard loud arguing coming from the Belinsky house, she called the station. I hadn't clocked out yet, so I came over as fast as I could to do a welfare check. I went in the rattling gate and I knocked on the door. I knew it would take Mrs. Belinsky a while to get to the door, so I made sure I listened for any raised voices, since that's what the neighbor's complaint said. When Mrs. Belinsky finally got to the door, she was in her house coat and carrying her little white poodle. She didn't seem to be in distress, but the dog looked a little agitated. Still, Mrs. Belinsky was surprised to see me. Apparently, she hadn't heard anything. She didn't have tenants at the moment, so she couldn't imagine why her neighbor would say she had heard yelling. Since she wasn't in danger and I couldn't hear anything, I asked if I could make a perimeter check of her property to make sure that everything was closed up tight. She didn't have a problem with that. So I walked around, tapping the windows to make sure none of them were loose and checking the door locks. The front of the house was fine, but the big backyard was overgrown in some spots, and that made me nervous. It was dark and the yard had some bushes that would make great cover for anybody trying to sneak around. I didn't see any signs that anybody had been there, but there was something about the yard that just made my skin crawl. Still, I didn't see any intruders or sign of trespassers, so I had to report to Mrs. Belinsky that everything was fine. I told her to call if she heard anything, and then I left. Everything seemed to go back to normal. I checked in with the neighbor who had made the initial report, but she hadn't heard anything further. I asked casually if she had seen anything or anybody in the backyard. Turns out her teenage son mowed Mrs. Belinsky's lawn for her, but he never said he saw anything. I chalked it up to a loud TV. I mean, Mrs. Belinsky was half deaf, and I considered the matter closed. Until the next Tuesday night when a different neighbor called the precinct to report what sounded like a man yelling at Mrs. Belinsky's house. I sped over there, lights and sirens, jerked open the gate, and sprinted up the steps. As I pounded on the storm door, the yelling cut off like somebody had yanked the plug on it. The hair on the back of my neck was already standing up, and the feeling only got worse as I waited for Mrs. Belinsky to come to the door. When she didn't, well, you don't have to be a cop to realize what was going through my head. By now, some of the neighbors were standing around, hanging at the fence line. I pounded on the door one more time and announced that I was the police. Still, nothing. I could hear sirens in the distance and I knew backup was coming, but I didn't want to wait. Not with the life of one elderly lady potentially hanging in the balance. So I kicked open the door and I went in. I knew the layout of Mrs. Belinsky's first floor since I had been there. The front room parlor, where she had all of her best furniture, was empty. 
and then the doorway opposite me led to the dining room, and then the kitchen. I knew she watched her shows in her little sitting room off of the dining room. If she was doing her usual thing and just hadn't heard me, I knew that that's where she would be. I was listening for any sounds, any sounds at all, but other than the sounds of the street outside, I didn't hear anything. I moved left, gun drawn, and I held low and ready, and I eased around the corner to peek into the sitting room. Mrs. B was in her rocking chair, either sleep or unconscious. She didn't appear to be injured, and there were no other signs of an intruder, but that didn't mean I relaxed. Her dog was missing. I holstered my service weapon and I tried to wake Mrs. Belinsky. To say she was surprised to see me was an understatement. Once I explained what had happened, I asked where the poodle was. She said she didn't know. That bad feeling had never really left, but now it came back with a vengeance. I got Mrs. B outside with the neighbors and I promised to look for her dog. I figured if the poodle wasn't with her owner, it probably wasn't on the first floor. So I went through the door that led to the second floor apartment. The layout up there was similar to Mrs. Belinsky's, with the hallway leading to the third floor stair in the back. Mrs. Belinsky's apartment was homey and old fashioned. These untenanted floors were unsettling, to say the least. Weird. The floors creaked under my weight, but the further into the space I went, the more muffled the sound seemed to be. It almost felt like I was underwater. Everything seemed to come to me slowly. Sound, thoughts, everything. The space was strange, but it was also empty. I headed for the stairway to the last apartment, and as soon as my shoe touched the steep painted stair, I heard yelling. I couldn't make out what was being said, but there was a very clear argument happening. Male and female voices. My training kicked in. I started up the stairs with my pulse pounding in my ears. I knew there were ten stairs. I knew because I counted them. But even though I knew that, I felt like I was climbing them forever. It was like the minutes were being stretched out like taffy by hands that I couldn't see, and for a reason that I didn't understand. Finally, I broke all my training, and I looked down at each step as I took it, mentally walking myself through the motions of picking up my foot, placing my foot on the next step. Now my foot is on this step. I'm moving up. I know it sounds utterly ridiculous now that I'm writing it, but at the time, it was the only way I could seem to get up there at all. And then I got to the third floor landing, and the door to the next apartment was right there. I could hear the argument again, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. It felt like I was hearing everything underwater. I'm ashamed to say this, but I actually broke out in goosebumps. I mean, I wasn't a rookie, and this wasn't my first domestic disturbance call, but I also knew that there shouldn't be anybody in that apartment to even have a disturbance. I took a deep breath, and I pounded on the door. Police! I don't have an explanation for what happened next, so I'll just report it. The landing got cold. Not, there was a breeze cold. Frigid so cold that I could see my breath puffing out, fast and uneven. The landing light came on even though I wasn't anywhere near the switch, and that somehow made the shadows at the edges of the landing even darker. At that point, all I wanted to do was to leave, but I couldn't make myself move. I have no idea what I would have done if I hadn't heard a whimper. I almost jumped out of my skin when something touched my leg. It was Mrs. Belinsky's little white dog shivering so hard that it looked like it was going to shake itself into pieces. I don't know what it was about the dog, but just having it there, knowing I needed to get it back to Mrs. B, who loved it, made me able to move. I scooped up the dog and I started hustling back down the stairs. I was terrified that it would take just as long to get down them as it had seemed to get up them, but I felt like I was able to move normally. I didn't breathe right until I got down to Mrs. Belinsky's floor. As soon as the poodle saw her, it squirmed out of my hold and trotted right over to her, who was sitting with the couple of neighbors. The cold feeling then vanished, and I was left feeling almost silly for being worried. Almost. I don't quite remember how I ended up filling out the incident report on that call, but I'm pretty sure I didn't mention cold spots. 
odd time distortions and an argument from people who didn't exist. As for Mrs. Belinsky's noise problem, well, her neighbors talked her into having her parish priest come over. And I guess the blessing the house did the trick. Or at least, I was never called back there for that kind of a disturbance again. Some cities and states get all the attention. Something strange happens in New York or Florida, and it's viral on social media within the hour. Strange things happen in the Ozarks, though, and nobody seems to care. I live in Benton County, Arkansas. Plenty of strange things have happened here, but only one strange thing has happened to me. That's what I want to talk about. I should confess something up front, I guess. I like the strange. When I hear something odd or unexplainable has happened, I run in that direction. I like the mystery, I think. I always wanted to feel like I was a part of something special, and special somethings didn't come often, though, to Benton County. Until 2016, that is. Two years prior, someone reportedly saw a strange creature wandering through the edge of the Ozark National Forest. It became my fixation. No one could prove that the man hadn't seen what he claimed, and I wanted to see it too. I made myself like hiking. I went out every day that I could, and I walked the longest and the least popular trails. I just wanted to catch a glimpse of that thing. I wanted to be a part of that story. I was an idiot. A few people took notice of my repeat visits. National Park Service, I guess. I don't blame them for keeping an eye on me. I do blame them for what ended up happening, though. They made me the latest in a long list of Benton County idiots. As I was saying, it was 2016, and I was on one of my usual hikes. I didn't notice anyone following me that day. I thought the rangers had gotten bored by then. I spotted something on the trail ahead of me, a small, gray, furry shape that didn't immediately resemble a fox or a rabbit. I was worried that it might be a little mountain lion cub. I've seen mother lions chase people off the trails, and I didn't want that to be the story I ended up with. But what if the cub wasn't a lion, I thought? What if it was actually the creature that I was looking for? I moved closer. When my feet shifted on the ground, the small animal saw me. It turned and it pointed its flat, feline nose in my direction. Right away I saw the two horn-like stumps growing from the top of its head. The little thing opened its mouth and made a pitiful mewing sound, sort of like a baby whining after a long nap. It made me smile. It wasn't what I'd been looking for, but it was certainly interesting and weird, too. And then something screamed from the tree line to my left. It screamed how a human woman might scream, how a human woman might scream if she was afraid for her life. I felt every bone in my body grow cold right that very moment. When I turned to look, I could only vaguely decipher the shape of the mother creature from its place in the shadows of the Ozarks. It looked like a big cat. Maybe a lion wasn't so far off. Its face was flat, and two antlers protruded from its head. Its tail looked naked too, maybe like a rat's. Maybe it had mange. I wasn't sure then, and I'm not sure now. All I'm sure is that when the beast opened its mouth, it cried in a way that only people should cry. It shrieked at me. It shrilled as it urged me away. I should have ran. I'd gone looking for this thing, right? And I know running is the last thing you want to do when you're caught by a mother defending her young. But I ran anyway, fighting or freezing or backing away slowly. None of that even occurred to me. I ran and I could hear it run behind me. It screamed while it chased me. It screamed so loud that I thought my ears might bleed. There was no telling how close it was either, not with a scream like that. Suddenly I wasn't alone on the trail. I was running past two park rangers. There were more following behind them. I kept running. Only after half a dozen rangers passed by me did I even consider that the monster was no longer behind me. The three gunshots that erupted behind me forced me to hit the ground. I landed on my knees and my hands. I felt like my heart and lungs were exploding. When they didn't, I looked up. Some of the rangers were already running back down the trail, shaking their heads and complaining about the run. I asked in disbelief, hadn't they seen it? No, they said. There was nothing there besides my screaming, they told me. 
Why was the gun fired? I asked. What gun? Even the ranger who emerged from the top of the trail with scuffs on his palms to his elbows insisted that they had not seen anything in the woods. They didn't see or hear anything chasing me down that trail. I had never been so mad. When I got back to town, I told anyone who would listen. I told them what I had seen and how the Park Service had reacted. The Park Service, of course, spun a yarn to make me look like the imbecile. They told my friends that I was found dehydrated in the woods, that I had been drinking, and I got turned around. The sun had scrambled my head, made me hallucinate. What choice did my friends have except to believe them? They all knew how desperate I was to be a part of a strange adventure. It didn't seem unreasonable to think that my mind invented a story when my body couldn't find one. But I know the truth. I know what I saw and what they saw and what they had to do in order to protect themselves. I know there's something deadly in the Ozarks. Next time, I'm going to take its picture. I don't know exactly what I saw. It was all just one big blur. And the more I think about it, the more questions I end up with. It was a cold winter night. The ground had a decent amount of snow on it. At the time, I was one of those park cops, the kind that you would see on horses in the movies. Only I had a small vehicle. We didn't ride horses. I patrolled a wooded area near the East Coast, and a lot of times the worst we would come across were just some teens kissing, making out, things like that. That was usually our eventful night busting kids for being too promiscuous. But the snow was out, and when the snow is out, the teens aren't as interested in being out. But I was doing my nightly due diligence, checking to make sure that the park was running properly, and that no one was lighting fires and things like that. Sometimes the homeless would set up a small spot where they could sit around a fire. I wish I could allow it. They deserve the warmth too, but we can't have anybody accidentally burning down trees or anything. So that's where I have to get involved. My first responsibility is human safety. After that, it's plant safety. That's what I like to think. Anyway, the snow wasn't falling anymore when this happened. It had stopped, and the snow on the ground was starting to freeze. It was a bit tough to move through, though, since the plows hadn't gone through the main roads yet. That meant the small roads weren't cleaned up at all, and it was just frigid. I have to admit, I was getting a little carsick from the bumpy ride. We weren't allowed to smoke in the park area, so I have this weird little area down by a waste management facility where I would go for a break. We have access to some of the dumpsters outside their enclosure, and the road and the little area that they are on isn't really owned by anybody. Sometimes we do find squatters hanging out there, but that night, it was empty. I was just taking my smoke break, catching my balance, you know, just taking it easy. It was weird how silent it was, like so quiet, but it was nice. I liked it. Then again, it was also kind of creepy. Anyway, I was smoking my cigarette and rubbing my hands together to try to get the blood moving when I heard some movement in the shrubs off to the side. It wasn't unusual, but it wigged me out a little because it had been so quiet. So I'm watching this bush. It wiggles a bit, but then it stops. Could have been a chipmunk or something, but it was pretty cold outside. Okay, I told myself, no biggie. I finished my cigarette, put it out, throw it in the dumpster, and get back in my vehicle. Then I start circling the area. Eventually, I come along a part of the road again, but a little further up towards some trees. Now, this area is dimly lit. Like I said, sometimes squatters come and they use the area. It is a great place to hide out if that's what you're trying to do. But then I noticed something very small and close to the ground. I didn't spot it at first. The snow was very white, and this thing was very pale too. At first, I thought it might have just been a plastic bag moving in the wind. But then I realized how round it was. It looked like a ball that you might play with in gym class. Just a plain, weird ball. Kind of like a tether ball. It was weird, though, because those balls are pretty hefty, but this thing was moving around in a way that wasn't like that. The wind couldn't be moving it. So I start to wonder if maybe somebody is moving the ball around and they're sitting under the tree. It's possible, but not likely. And that's when the thing moved more, like 
I watched it. I watched as this ball grew a torso and arms, and it kind of propped itself up. And now it no longer looked like a ball. It looked like a large, round head on this tiny, frail body. It was creepy as all get out, but I thought maybe it could be a kid, baby left in the snow. So I stopped my car and I get out. I move slowly towards the tree, and when I went to look for this kid, it wasn't there. It disappeared. But the weird thing was that the spot where it had been standing had been disturbed. So something was sitting in that spot, but was now gone. The other weird thing was that there weren't any footsteps around. I couldn't have followed its trail. So it pretty much just, poof, went away into thin air. I walked around for some time, and I radioed my supervisor. I started a whole search team for this endangered kid. I really thought somebody was in danger, but we never found them. And after that, I kind of lost my credibility. I was honest, though. I told them that I saw this weird, possibly malnourished small child in the snow. And when I went to help this child, it had disappeared. I guess I can see why nobody believed me. But I didn't think that I would be labeled as crazy. I'd been a good deputy, and I had always had the best intentions of the park and everybody in it. I know I'm not crazy. I'm not. I saw something that night. And I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know it was something that, to me, looked like it needed help. I'll help anybody. Really, anybody. It was freaky looking, but it looked cold and kind of sick, too. I'm still kind of worried about that thing that I saw. What if it was a kid, but now it's gone because I didn't save it? That crosses my mind from time to time, even though there are no missing children in the area. But I remind myself that I did what I could. I looked for it. My intention was good. It really was. I'm a retired sheriff. And this incident happened quite a while ago now, but it's the only thing in all of my years on the job that I could never explain. I was working for a district in rural Illinois. There wasn't much that went on in that county, and we all liked it that way. Occasionally, I would have to deal with domestic disturbances or property damage, but it wasn't anything like working in a big city. Of course, we would get calls about teenagers disturbing the peace, usually on the weekends. One of the downsides of being in a rural setting is that there's not much to do, so kids tend to go around and cause trouble. Normally it isn't much of an issue, and just me showing up in the squad car is enough to scare them straight. This particular incident happened on a Friday night. There's a section of densely wooded hiking trails open to the public at the edge of town. There's about 14 miles of trails in total. The trails aren't very well maintained, and they go pretty deep into the woods. There's a creek that flows through the woods. It used to be a proper river years ago, but it's dried up quite a bit for whatever reason. I'm not a conservation officer, so I couldn't tell you why. Back in the late 1800s, there used to be a mill on the river, and its remnants still stand there today. These days, the old mill has become a hangout for local teenagers to drink. Last time I was out there, it was full of empty cans and bottles and graffiti. The kids think that they're far enough into the forest to avoid getting caught, but the problem is that there are several homes that surround this plot of woods, and the people who live there can hear the kids partying. I got a noise complaint from one of the neighbors claiming that they had heard kids screaming, and they saw flashing lights in the forest near the old mill. This definitely wasn't my first time busting teenagers at the mill, so I headed out without a second thought. The hike to reach the mill was about three miles. Not exactly how I wanted to spend my Friday night, but I suppose it all pays the same. There weren't any cars parked in the public lot when I arrived, but that didn't necessarily mean anything. Teenagers up to no good are smart, and they probably parked elsewhere and walked in. So I headed into the woods with my flashlight. I could hear the kids laughing and yelling just about as soon as I set foot on the trail. They didn't sound too far away, certainly not far enough to be at the mill. My first thought was I was glad I wasn't going to have to hike all the way to the mill tonight. At first, it sounded like the voices were coming from somewhere left of my location. But as I tried to follow them, they moved to my right. I called out and I told them to stop screwing around, but I didn't get any answer. I knew that they most likely saw me and were heading out of there as fast as they could. 
so I decided to head to the old mill anyway since that was where the neighbor claimed the lights were coming from, and quite possibly there would still be something going on there. The forest got quiet for the rest of my walk. The trail was severely overgrown, but I managed to follow it, even in the dark. I heard the creak, and I knew I was close, and that's when I heard the voices again. Same as last time. It was just screaming and laughing, but I couldn't make out any words. I shined my flashlight towards the mill, but I didn't see anybody. They were somewhere in the forest, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly where. The voices somehow both sounded far away and very close at the same time, and they also seemed to come from all directions. I shined my light into the woods, and I caught multiple lights reflecting back at me. My first thought was flashlights, but as I looked closer, they were eyes. There must have been at least twelve sets of eyes, all standing about my height. They stayed hidden in the shadows, so I couldn't get a good look at what their faces looked like, but I saw that they had ghostly white skin. Their voices sounded human, even though they didn't speak any words that I knew. And when I saw their eyes, I knew that they were something else entirely. I slowly backed away down the trail. I didn't want to run in case it triggered these things to chase me. I did shine my light once again at the mill, and I don't know why I did it. I wasn't thinking rationally at that point, but the dilapidated old building lit up entirely with eyes. I didn't stick around to count them, but there must have been at least another ten sets of them in there. The voices followed me all the way back to my car, and it was the most terrifying thing that I had ever experienced. The voices were coming from all directions, some close, some far away. It was like they were trying to lure me off the trail or get me lost. Now, I'm not religious, but I was praying to all the gods to get me out of there and safely back to my car that night. Miraculously, I managed to follow the trail out. I was pretty shaken up by the time I got back to the car. I went back to the station and I locked myself inside for the rest of my shift. I didn't know what to write in the report log either. I never talked to the person who left the complaint about the teenagers that night. It was just a message on the answering machine at the station. When I tried to call the number, it was disconnected. I did some digging on that phone number and it didn't belong to anybody in our county. I then pulled the phone records from the station and I matched every incoming call from that day and the day before, and it just didn't exist. I couldn't explain any of this. I decided to make a report of a dangerous black bear in the woods and we put up barricades to keep people out of there. I don't know what those things were that I saw, but I knew that they were not anything good and I had to keep people away from them. Hey Lilith, I recently experienced a disturbing series of events that are hands down the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I told a few people about it, but sharing it on a forum like yours, where people are open-minded, feels like the best way to really get this off my chest. I work at a demolition company and we were hired to raise a house in the suburb of Omaha, Nebraska. The house was in foreclosure and had sat abandoned for many years. The bank was unable to sell the property, and the house began to deteriorate, becoming an eyesore in the neighborhood. Ultimately, the bank decided to tear it down while it considered what to do with the lot. I admit, the house was a bit creepy in its rundown condition, but that didn't mean it was haunted. It's not like we heard rumors about it either, and it wasn't anything that crossed my mind as we did the initial inspections. That is until we went in the basement and noticed an area of carpet that looked like it was stained with black mold. The carpet wasn't wet or anything, but after we tore it up, we found a trap door hidden underneath. It was closed pretty snugly, and when we pried it open, we discovered a small cubicle, about five feet by five feet, with the walls and floor comprised of wooden planks crudely put together. The odd thing was that carved into those planks were these weird symbols. At first I thought they were satanic, but upon closer look, they were something else. Maybe something archaic and pagan. Stranger still, there were words etched into the planks, but it was a language that I didn't recognize. And scattered on the floor were several charred, decomposed bird skeletons and other bones, small bones. It looked like some kind of a ritual sacrifice or an offering. 
Who knows what its purpose was, but it wasn't something that would stop us from doing our job. We completed our inspection, made sure all the permits were in order, and we scheduled to begin demolition the following day. The job would take about five days in total. The first day went off without a hitch, but the second day, we ran into mechanical and electrical problems with our hydraulic excavator and other equipment. Incidentally, it happened just as we were digging up the basement and that cubicle. The machinery was fine before that. There's no reason why it should suddenly crap out on us. Later that night, the really weird stuff started happening. After my wife and kids went upstairs to bed, I was home in my home office working on a bid when I heard people talking in the living room. I thought my wife and kids had come back downstairs, but when I called out to them, they didn't respond. I walked out into the living room and the voices suddenly became whispers, like they knew I was coming and they were trying to be quiet. The living room was dark, but I could still make out the silhouettes of furniture and there was clearly nobody there. But in the split second before I flipped on the light switch, I swear I saw a tall, shadowy figure standing in the far corner. It stood maybe seven feet, and I could make out the outline of a trench coat and a top hat. As soon as I turned on the light, the voices stopped, and the figure disappeared. Sure enough, the living room was empty. I thought I was seeing and hearing things, and then I felt this really malevolent vibe as chills ran up my spine. I didn't want to be downstairs alone anymore, so I closed up my office and I went upstairs to bed. A few hours later, I was awoken by the sound of loud footsteps running back and forth in the hallway. It didn't seem to wake up my wife, so I got up to see what was going on. As soon as I opened the bedroom door, the footsteps stopped. But at the end of the darkened hallway, I could see that tall figure. That tall, shadowy figure with the top hat, just standing there. I quickly turned on a light, but again, the figure disappeared. Now I have to admit, it shook me, so I left the light on. And it was hard to get back to sleep. I kept drifting in and out, waking up at every little sound, real or imagined. In one of my stupors, I swear I saw that shadow figure standing at the foot of my bed. But as soon as I snapped up, it was gone. It left me petrified with this overwhelming feeling of dread, and I felt like it was just playing with me. The next day at the site, I was exhausted, and I noticed that the other guys looked just as sleep-deprived as me. We got to talking, and I found out that each of them saw the exact same shadow figure with a top hat in their own homes. We were all spooked. We couldn't help but think about the cubicle in the basement. Did we disturb something that we weren't supposed to? Was this some kind of a witchcraft? We tried to get to work, but we ran into the same mechanical problems as the day before. Finally, I suggested getting a priest to come and bless the site before we could continue any further. Everybody agreed, even the one guy that wasn't religious and didn't believe in the supernatural. We went to my local church and told one of the priests what was going on. He listened, and he could see how scared we were. He came down to the site, and he blessed the area and said some prayers and then he was gracious enough to go to each of our homes and say some prayers there as well. Well, it seemed to do the trick. The next day we had no issues with the machinery, and we were able to get back on schedule. In fact, we were so eager to demolish that house that we actually finished a day early. None of us saw that shadow figure again either. It took me a few days to settle down and stop peering into the darkness to try to find it. I still have no idea what it was, why it appeared, and how it connected to that house. Even though the priest seemed to put an end to it, I feared for whatever would be built on that lot and for whomever would eventually move in there. By the grace of God, I hope that the prayers were strong enough to keep it away for good. I started working in IT shortly after my first postgrad internship ended. I had been a computer science major, but I figured that I had to pay a couple of dues before being able to open and run the business that I had always dreamed of. So I was working with this temp agency, and I kind of shuddered knowing how overqualified I was to be working amongst the other temps. Seriously, this was intended as a baby step. They set me up at this printing company that I had never heard of. 
I was planning on staying for less than a year so I could just get some real-world experience for my resume. But it was hard to even think about sticking it out, even from that very first day. There's only one other person who worked in the IT department, and they scared the hell out of me. He probably was once a promising young professional with big dreams and high ambitions, but was now a sappy, middle-aged IT guy who always looked miserable. I tried my best not to engage with him too much. The possibility of ending up like him was too much to even consider, too. But I wasn't there to make any friends, so I won't deny the fact that I was a little less than friendly. Our department was essentially just a tiny, dark office with two desks. We had to spend a lot of time shut in that room together, so whenever there was a service request, I jumped at the opportunity to solve it. A few months into things, I finally learned a little bit about my coworker. He had been a lot like me when he was my age, so I asked him why he never moved on from the job. Apparently, he thought I was just a gullible idiot and told me some hokey legend about this apparent entity down in the basement. He said that when he first started working there, his coworker told him about it. So when he saw the thing in the basement, it scared him so much, so much to the point that he couldn't leave. Some hybrid of Stockholm Syndrome or an utter BS is what I thought it was. I just rolled my eyes and sarcastically thanked him for the honesty. But he insisted that he wasn't fibbing, and he just told me that if I wanted, I could go check it out for myself. I scoffed. I was a well-educated, soon-to-be professional, not some small-town ghost hunter. But he was adamant that he was being truthful. So with a hefty groan and an urge to put a stop to it, I obliged. I grabbed a small flashlight that I kept in my desk drawer, and I headed down to the basement. I hadn't spent much, if any, time down there. As far as I could tell, it was just another storage vessel for the company. I had seen my coworker go down a few times for extra paper and staples, but that was it. The building we worked in was small, two levels with an added basement, no elevator. I kicked open the door to the staircase leading down. The smell was immediately dank and musty. It reminded me of a sweaty gym bag or a mildewy towel. I flicked my flashlight on in front of me and headed down the stairs. There was a ton of surplus crap everywhere, ceiling high towers of cardboard boxes, and the room itself was rectangular with this concrete divider between the front and the far side. I let my flashlight roam over the walls in the front half of the basement. Nothing was out of the ordinary, just poorly organized and overstuffed. The basement could really stand to hire an organizer or something, or a maid at least. I shuffled over to the concrete divider, and an unexpected wave of apprehension passed over me. I shook it off, and I rounded the divider to the other side. There were a few towering piles of boxes in the darkest, furthest corner, and two desks, almost identical to those upstairs. I glided the flashlight over them. Yes, they were the exact same desks as upstairs, but these were covered in years of dust and grime. When my flashlight slid from the desk surface to the negative space next to it, I almost lost it. My flashlight shone directly into two milky, dead eyes staring directly at me. I jumped. I dropped the flashlight, sending it rattling to the floor. When it stopped, it cast a steady beam of light from the floor, and it illuminated two skeletal, slimy-looking feet poking out of the darkness. The light stopped at the creature's shins, showcasing the oily gray skin covering the malnourished body. With shaking fingers, I reached out for the flashlight. A hand then appeared from the darkness and grabbed my wrist. I wanted to scream, but when I tried, I physically could not. It was as if the thing's touch had silenced me. The skin was cold and sick with I don't even want to know with what. It couldn't have been good. And as its grasp on my wrist began to tighten, I knew I needed to break free. It started to pull me closer to the corner, into the darkness. This horrible hooting sound echoed through the basement. It sounded like it was closing in on me. So with all the strength that I could muster, I yanked my wrist from the hold, and I heard the sound of its body crashing into the tower of boxes. 
I grabbed my flashlight and I ran from the sounds. I made it up the stairs and I slammed the door shut. When I returned to my little office, my face said it all. My coworker even had the nerve to laugh out loud, knowing what had happened. I knew I couldn't say anything. I didn't even make a noise for the rest of the day. And I'm only now sharing this with you. I did leave that job the next week. I just couldn't handle looking into that coworker's face, knowing what he knew and what he had sent me to. Anyway, luckily I found you, and now I feel that I can share this story in this safe space that you offer. Thank you for that. I was a city worker in a tourist town on one of the Great Lakes. I'm not sure if I feel comfortable saying which one on here. I've never told this story to anyone before today, and I don't want anyone I know to think I'm crazy. I don't believe in ghosts or monsters or the supernatural, but I don't have any other explanation for what I saw. I was working on an old historic lighthouse. The city wanted to refurbish it and potentially open it to the public for tours, but it needed some electrical work done first, so they hired yours truly. Now, if you've ever done any work in old buildings, they can be a bit of a challenge. There's always something that goes wrong in one way or another, and I was having one of those days. I had a pretty busy week scheduled, so I wanted to get this lighthouse done by the end of the day, at whatever cost, and that meant staying late, well after dark. I never once had a strange feeling about the lighthouse or the surrounding area. People always talk about how they knew something was wrong before it happened, but I never got that feeling. I won't say it wasn't a little creepy to be working alone in this lighthouse once the sun went down, but I never felt anything bad. I should probably say a little bit about the lake I was overlooking. Without giving away the exact location, this particular lake is known for its bad storms and shipwrecks. Storms that seem to come out of nowhere. It can be calm here one minute and white caps the next. I was intent on my work, trying to get this thing done as quickly as possible, when I heard the sound of a ship's horn. This isn't a functioning lighthouse and large ships don't typically come this way anymore. I looked out the window and I didn't see any lights out there on the water, but the sound of the horn was deafening. I knew I wasn't imagining it. I stared out the window for a moment. I know it was only a few seconds but it felt longer. I was entranced. Suddenly a thick fog began to roll in from the lake, and it crept across the rocks and all the way to the base of the lighthouse. It was insane how quickly it appeared, but this lake is known for changing weather. And then I heard the horn again. It was undoubtedly the horn of a ship, but as I said before, there were no ships on this part of the lake. I went back to my work, I was so close to getting this thing up and running, and I really wanted to be done with the project. And then I was interrupted, again, but this time by a light shining through the window. It was blinding, and I couldn't see where it was coming from. For a moment, I was terrified it was a ship about to crash into the rocks, because the only thing in that direction was the water. The whole thing was a little weird, too. The unexplainable ship's horn and the sudden blinding light. I decided to head down the stairs and investigate what on earth was going on outside. The lighthouse only had the one window facing the lake, so I couldn't see anything facing land. When I got outside, the fog was so thick that I could barely see my hands in front of me. I heard the ship's horn once again, and this time I could pinpoint the sound coming from towards the water. I swore I heard a woman crying, but I wasn't exactly sure. It was like the fog had muffled the sound. I walked further towards the water, and I reached the rocks, and I made sure to step carefully so I didn't misjudge where I was standing and fall in. The sound of the woman crying grew stronger, and as I got closer, it sounded less like crying, and now it sounded more like singing. I followed the voice. I don't know why. Looking back, it was a terrible idea, but that never crossed my mind at the time. I know I said before that people usually instinctively know when there's something wrong. I never felt any of that. The fog was so thick that I didn't see the creature until I almost stepped on it. It stopped singing when I reached it, and it had this human voice, but it was definitely not human. 
It was a little bald thing with pale skin and big silver eyes. I had never seen eyes like that before. It smelled of fish, and it had teeth that I can only describe as similar to a cat's. I pulled out my utility knife as soon as I saw its teeth. I didn't know what it was, but I didn't want it to come near me. I don't know if it was fear or anger in those big silver eyes, but it took one look at me and it leapt into the water. I don't know how else to describe it. It had legs and arms like a person, but it definitely was not a person. I never told anybody what I saw. Not ever. I mean, how can you explain that to people? I'm convinced it tried to lure me out there with the sound of the ship and the light and the singing. I don't know what its end goal was, and I'm not sure that I really want to know. I locked the lighthouse up for the night and I decided to finish the next day. I didn't run into anything strange out there in the daylight, and I did walk down to that spot again where I saw the creature, and this time, there were no signs of it. I know you get a lot of letters from park rangers, and I never thought I would be one of them, but I'm writing this anyway. I don't work in a big national park, but that doesn't mean that I don't have my fair share of adventures. And this story is definitely not the kind of story you tell to family around the dinner table. Like a lot of people who work as park rangers, I love the outdoors. I don't want to be under a roof. I want to be out, hiking, trail clearing, whatever. I work at Henry W. Coe State Park, an 87,000-acre reserve in Northern California. It's a big place full of relatively unspoiled wilderness and gorgeous scenery. We have fishing, hunting, and even equestrian campgrounds if you want to bring your horse. The park is what you would call rugged. In fact, some of the more adventurous hiking loops are steep enough that you need to be in great shape to make it all the way through. Naturally, Maintaining the trails is important, and checking trail conditions can take a long time. Typically, we do our routine patrols alone, but there are times and places where we go in pairs. Since I've been on the job for a while, I usually have one of the more junior park rangers with me. It's nice because I like showing them some of the spots only a longtime ranger could know. We don't talk about it much, but there are a few places in Henry Co. Park that, well, they have a history. Actually, a lot of the park has a history, but it's not generally known. This is one. The park staff calls it Hangman's Hill, and it's not just a scenic overlook with an interesting name. That title was earned because the tree at the top was used to execute more than one outlaw during California's Wild West days. Since Hangman's Hill is a popular hiking destination, the trail and the area see more use than most. We regularly patrol and check the trail conditions to make sure that they're as safe as possible. I was out on patrol with Oliver, one of the newest park rangers. We were hiking the long loop up to Hangman's Hill. It starts out easy, but the middle section gets steep and rough, and even the best hikers need to take breaks. We did a little trail maintenance along the way, making sure that trash was picked up. It always amazes me that people can't leave the wilderness the way they found it. There were a few places where there were deeper ruts in the dirt, like something had been digging in the trail, but we filled those in. The day was perfect for hiking, clear blue sky, annoyingly bright sunshine, and the weather was a crisp 73 degrees. Oliver and I made good time as we progressed up the trail. We passed a few hikers, but apparently Hangman's Hill wasn't popular that day. That was fine by me. We had been getting some complaints about downed tree limbs up there, and the last thing I wanted to do was deal with the public while I was trying to hack up a giant branch. At the halfway point, when the trail gets steep enough that you're climbing rather than hiking, we took a breather and I casually asked Oliver whether he had been up this trail before. He hadn't. This was always the awkward part of breaking in a new park ranger because it can go one of two ways. I can warn them, nothing happens, and they think I'm being a jerk and complain to our supervisor or they don't believe me, and if something does happen, I have to deal with a terrified co-worker who complains to our supervisor. So over protein bars, I ask Oliver if he's ever even heard of Hangman's Hill. He said he hasn't. I think, well, this is going to be fun. So I casually mention that the site has a lot of history behind it. Desperados, horse rustlers, claim jumpers, and classic Wild West justice. 
There was even an infamous pair of brothers who were hanged up there. I don't lay it on too thick, I just tell it like a historical lecture. And I can tell that Oliver is taking it in like classroom information. I don't think that it'll last long, but I guess it depends on the hill. So the hike up to the crest of Hangman's Hill takes another hour. And the minute we get close to the site, I can tell it's going to be a rough visit. The bright sun that's been making me squint even though I'm wearing sunglasses, and my uniform hat is strangely cool and dim. There's a breeze moving through the pines at the perimeter of the hill. The perimeter, not the hilltop itself. The hanging tree is the only thing at the top, and it stands at the center of the hill. Nothing but grass grows around it. No flowers. No scrub. Just weedy grass that's so tough it doesn't care about what else is up there. The tree itself is completely bare. Bark beetles got to it decades ago, and a burned-out hollow at the base shows that it's been struck by lightning at least once. Most of the tree limbs are long gone except for one. The one branch that still exists is thick, and it juts out far to the right. It's about 12 feet off the ground. Perfect height for a hangman's noose. Going up to Hangman's Hill is never a good time, but there is a job to do. I point out the dead fall and broken branches from the last windstorm in the stand of pine trees, and Oliver and I get to work. I give him credit for keeping his cool, but I also wonder how long it will take before he notices that, aside from the strangely loud sound of our saws, there is no sound at the top of the hill. No birdsong, no wind, not pine branches knocking together in the breeze. The fact that I can feel a breeze, but not hear it, it's a bad sign, number two. We finish cutting the deadfall into manageable logs, and we stack them off to the side, and that's when Oliver really looks at the hanging tree. He asks me why we don't cut it down. It's dead. I'm all set to give him the it's a historical marker talk when the wind we can't hear shifts, blowing right past the tree. I smell the unmistakable sick, sweet stink of rot and decay, even though there isn't anything dead that I can see. All of a sudden, I feel a blast of wind rush up the hilltop, and there's sound again. Men swearing, the deep grunts of neighing of horses, the crack of gunshot bounces all around us, and both of us hit the ground out of a reflex. Oliver's looking around for the shooter. I'm looking at the tree. There's something on it. Or, well, two somethings. Two black, ragged shapes, heads tilted at unnatural angles, twisting in the wind as they dangle from the thick black rope slung over the single long branch. The wind shifts to bring the stink of whiskey and body odor right into our faces, and there's a huge, horrible feeling of pressure, like we're in the eye of the storm, and the sunlight goes so pale that it might as well not be there. I manage to tell Oliver that we're done. Time to head out. I dig into my pack for the emergency bottle of whiskey I carry when I have to come up here, and I roll it toward the hanging tree. Oliver and I slide back over the edge of the hill and we scramble down the slope. We don't talk for a long time. When we get back to the ranger station, I open up my desk drawer for another bottle of whiskey, and I offer him some. He shakes his head. When I come in the next day, I hear that Oliver has put in for a transfer. Me? I'm still here. After all, Somebody has to keep Hangman Hill's ghosts supplied with whiskey. I was working for the Wisconsin DNR when I was sent out to investigate a wild deer with potential chronic wasting disease. It had been reported on the eastern section of the Ice Age Trail. It's a pretty popular trail in the state, so I was told to find the deer quickly and dispatch of it if it had any signs of CWD. Three different hikers had reported it over the last week, all around the same area. All of the reports said the deer was malnourished, severely injured, and smelled of infection. This description didn't necessarily lead me to believe it was a case of CWD. The more likely cause was an injury that had become gangrene. Either way, the deer likely needed to be humanely dispatched. The section of trail the deer was reported on was difficult to access with a vehicle so I ended up needing to hike in. The deer was reported to be hanging out near one of the public shelters, with the last sighting being less than a full day ago. If the deer was in as bad a shape as the witnesses claimed, I didn't expect it to have gotten far, even if it was still alive. 
I reached the shelter just as a storm began to roll in, which was odd. I didn't see any evidence of rain on the weather forecast that morning, but it looked like it was going to get ugly. I looked around quickly for the deer, but the rain started to fall heavily, and I decided to wait it out in the shelter. The shelters in this area of the park are more like little cabins. They are used often by backpackers who are through hiking, so it wasn't an unpleasant place to wait out the storm. Just as soon as I took off my backpack and sat down, I was overcome by the stench of rotting flesh. It came out of nowhere, and it was so strong that I was nearly gagging. I looked around the interior of the shelter to see if I could find the source. I thought I saw something move past the doorway, but when I peeked outside, there was nothing but rain. The stench then disappeared as quickly as it had arrived. There was no explanation for it. I tried to eat one of the granola bars I had packed, but I just couldn't find my appetite. The rain was pelting the shelter and spraying in through the open doorway. I tried to check the weather forecast on my phone, but there was no service. I waited in the shelter for maybe another 30 minutes. The storm hadn't let up, but the stench suddenly returned. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew there was something terribly wrong. I can't explain how I knew. I just knew. And then I heard something scrape against the side of the shelter. It was loud, even with the rain outside. I looked out through the window and I saw what looked to be white antlers. Now that didn't make any sense at all. It was early summer here in Wisconsin and bucks don't start growing their antlers until much later in the season. And even if, for some reason, they were early, they would still be covered in felt. I figured this must be the injured deer and it certainly smelled like it was on death's door. I tried to get a better look out the window, but the animal appeared to be moving towards the door of the shelter. Whatever it was, I was about to see it soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling, though, that there was something off about this whole situation. There was something more to this injured deer. I knew that much, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I had the gun I packed in to dispatch this deer. I pointed it at the door, and I waited. The doorway was dark because of the storm outside, but I could still see well enough to know that the creature that walked into view wasn't an old, injured deer. It was about twice the size of a white tail, and its body was absolutely skeletal. I could have counted its ribs even without the rain soaking the beast. Its fur was long and stringy like the kind of long hair you would find on a dog, and parts of it were missing its fur completely. But that's not the worst part. Its head was a skull. No hair, no skin, just bone with the antlers attached, and I didn't see any eyes in its sockets, but like I said, it was dark. I could see it had a tongue in its jaw, and its teeth looked like those of a deer. The lower jaw didn't appear to be hanging on by much, and I don't know what the thing was. I gave it about ten seconds standing there in that dark, rain-soaked doorway before I fired at it. I hit that beast three times center mass, and it ran away. It literally ran away like it had been scared or something. Not like it had just been blasted with a shotgun, because it didn't fall down, and it didn't even falter a step. It just ran. I waited another hour for the storm to pass before hiking out of there. I had never been so scared in my life. If a shotgun couldn't stop it, there was nothing I could do if I ran into it again. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally reached my truck. I had no idea what to report to my boss, either. I told him that there was something terribly wrong with the deer, and that it was something I had never seen before. Also that I had shot at it three times and it acted like it was nothing. No one believed me. I ended up leaving that position in six months for a desk job, and I never, never, ever go hiking alone anymore. Hey Lilith, I've listened to your channel for a while now, and I've met most of your stories with a mix of skepticism and awe. It's hard to believe that so many mystical creatures and beings exist in the world, and I thought that maybe some people were exaggerating or even straight up lying. Well, I no longer believe that. After hearing so many stories, I felt inspired to try to hunt down one of these things myself. I grew up in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, which is right on the border of Pennsylvania and Delaware. There's a state park close by, Brandywine State Park, where the famous battle was fought. A small part of that park is known as Beaver Valley. From satanic cults to a town full of little people, the number of conspiracies surrounding the place can lead you down quite a rabbit hole. 
I've been there in the daytime once or twice. Some people used it as a shortcut when Naaman's Road was backed up, but never at night and never on any of the roads that supposedly harbored evil spirits. Well, one night after getting out of work around 11 o'clock but feeling adventurous, I called my friend Alan to see if he wanted to check the place out with me. He agreed, and within a half hour I had picked him up and we were on our way. The park itself is pretty big, and there are multiple roads leading into and out of it. Navigating it can be a little confusing, and cell phone service stinks down there, so GPS apps don't always work. Alan said he knew his way around, but I didn't really believe him. It didn't matter. I didn't have anything else to do this late at night anyway. So driving through the outskirts of the park was a little creepy. A few people live back in there, but there's no streetlights at all. The only illumination we had was being cast by my car's headlights. The roads rose and fell and curved often, sometimes sharply, so I had to give driving my full attention. Eventually, we found what we were looking for, Satan's Road, so called because of the way that the trees grow along the road. They all curve away from the road as if they're trying to uproot and escape something that's coming from deeper within the forest. I've heard about it plenty of times, but actually seeing it, well, that's a very different experience. There are rumors of cults practicing satanic rituals here in the wood. Recalling the rumors and seeing the trees, I was starting to feel like I had my fill of weirdness for the night. I was thinking about getting through as fast as I could and getting back out onto one of the larger roads when Alan gave a surprised yelp from the passenger seat. He told me that he was looking in the forest beside the car, and he had seen something running along before disappearing into the brush. He didn't know what it was, but he said it could have been a deer or something. There's a lot of them back there. I hoped so, and I kept driving. I figured out we were three quarters of the way through when I rounded another sharp curve, and I had to slam on my brakes. I had almost hit it. Right in front of the car, about ten feet away, shining in the headlights, stood a completely naked man. Now it was January, and the temperatures have been dropping into the 30s lately, so the guy should have been freezing. A tall, thin man, filthy with long, matted brown hair and an unkempt beard, stood staring into the windshield, not shivering or showing any signs of being exposed to the cold. And his breath wasn't even fogging. Alan and I sat silently, both too shocked to say anything, and honestly... I was extremely scared. It started to get colder, and even inside the car I started to shiver, and then a moment later was shivering uncontrollably. Alan was doing the same right next to me. I began coming around to what was happening, and I reached down to put the car in reverse. Something was telling me to just get the hell out of there and leave the naked guy standing in the road, but the car would not move. I was pressing the gas and the engine wouldn't even rev. I wasn't even sure that the car was on anymore. Now my head was beginning to feel foggy. Thoughts and ideas kept forming in my head, but they were slipping away before they could take root. I vaguely remember Alan next to me reciting something that sounded like a Bible verse. As far as I know, Alan isn't particularly religious, and I found it strange that he could quote passages from the Bible. And then the man started to move slowly stepping backward, methodically, foot after foot, still staring right into the windshield at me and Alan. The man backed away, completely out of view of the headlights, and then all that was in front of us was a stretch of empty road. I started warming up immediately, and the fogginess began drifting away. And then I saw the eyes. Ahead on the road coming from where the man had disappeared was this pair of narrowed red orbs hovering about eight feet off the ground. They were moving slowly up and down as if attached to something moving. They were. The creature slowly appeared in view of the light. It had the shape and size of a horse, but the head, the head was a sick cross between a ram and a man. Curling horns jutted from both sides and wisps of dark fur, but the nose and the mouth were unmistakably human. The fogginess returned tenfold, and I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer. I woke up to banging on my window next to my head, and I had an excruciating headache, and there was a light being shined in my face. 
it was a police officer. In short, we had come to in a small clearing off the roundabout about three miles away from where we had been. Alan had passed out as well, and neither of us could recall anything. The police officer asked us a lot of questions and even searched the car for drugs and gave me a breathalyzer. We told him everything, and by the time we were done, he must have just thought we were some kind of weird loonies, and he just wanted to get rid of us. We hadn't really done anything illegal, at least I didn't think so, so he let us go. I don't know how we ended up in the clearing, and I don't remember what happened after, well, after we saw the thing. I mean, bits and pieces are coming back to me slowly. I'm trying to think of all kinds of excuses. Maybe something was up with my car and we got a non-lethal dose of carbon monoxide or something. I don't know. I can't explain it. Since that night, there are random moments where I feel a sense of overwhelming terror, like something horrible is only seconds away from happening. And for some reason, the date of August 17th, 2026, is constantly on my mind. I can't get it out of my head, and I have no idea why. Command told me it was a training accident, but I'm not so sure. Something weird happened during our final field training exercise. I mean, really weird. Not just the usual, did I see what I thought I saw because I've been sleep deprived for 15 weeks kind of weird. I'm an army combat medic, which means that after completing basic training, I opted to train more so that I could become a medical specialist. Combat medic training is four straight months of 16 to 20 hour days, constantly working learning how to save the lives of my battle buddies and not how to become a casualty myself. I'd made it through to the final, which put me at Joint Base San Antonio for the field training exercise. It's basically the eight-day final exam from hell, where we go through everything we might be expected to come across while we're on duty. My squad was doing the dismounted patrol, which is exactly what it sounds like. Soldiers walking patrol, ready for action. It was hard. It's meant to be hard. But when I was in the middle of it, all I could focus on was making it through. We were walking our route, moving single file through heavy brush. Not a lot of visibility, plenty of things that crunch underfoot while you walk. It was basically a live training sim. We had weapons, but no real ammunition, our full kit, and we had standard combat objectives to accomplish. We all knew that at some point we would find another patrol. One of the situations we had to deal with was finding casualties, which we would have to assess, treat, and medevac. It wasn't anything we hadn't been through already, we'd all just been through basic training. We were all stressed beyond belief, but we were soldiers, we were medics, and we were all determined to make it through this together. We'd been walking the patrol route for a while when we found the ambush. Soldiers were lying scattered around a clearing, some in cover and some in the open. Some of them were groaning in pain. Others weren't making any noise. TV medics will rush forward to help the wounded before securing the area. Combat medics aren't that dumb. We deployed to secure the area, and that's when the bad guys showed back up. Knowing that the bad guys were actually our own instructors, it didn't make it feel any less stressful. At that point, I'm pretty sure seeing a fluffy bunny would have sent me, at least, into overdrive. Our squad took casualties as we suppressed the threat, which gave us additional patients. We started triage, followed the protocol for assessing which patients could be treated first or had to be treated first. Soldiers with small cuts weren't the priority. The patient who took a round to the leg and was bleeding from a femoral artery was. So nothing I've described so far was weird. It was all what we had been led to understand would be happening. Dismounted patrol. Find wounded, care for them, achieve the tactical objective while dealing with casualties. But this was where it got strange. My partner and I were working on our patient who had a simulated gunshot wound to the thoracic cavity. We were working through the MARCH protocol. We all knew it in our sleep at this point. Massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulation, hypothermia. We were behind some heavy cover while the security detail did their job and kept us clear from bad guys. We were shouting to each other, trying to get our patients to talk to us. Maybe that's why we didn't hear anything. Someone shouted, 
and we froze. It was like a yell like we had never heard before. I'd heard soldiers who got wounded during basic. Accidents happen, but this sounded different. My partner and I looked at each other as we worked on our patient. I could see the look on his face. We worked on autopilot to stabilize our wounded, but I think we were both wondering the same thing. Was there a second wounded patrol we were supposed to find? When we finished, we filled out the patient's paperwork, tagged it on his belt, and got ready for evacuation. That's when Staff Sergeant Meadows came running over. He told us to form up and come with him. When your sergeant tells you to do something, you do it. My partner and I handed over our patient and we grabbed our rifles and we followed him into the brush at a run. We saw the bushes before we saw the body, but Staff Sergeant Meadows skidded to a halt and motioned for us to hold while he secured the area. That's when I noticed that his rifle didn't have an orange painted dummy clip. He had live ammunition. At that point, I knew something was wrong. But like I said, I was in combat medic mode and I was following protocol because that's what you do to stay alive. I waited until Staff Sergeant waved us forward, and once he did, my battle buddy and I darted forward to the casualty. Actually, seeing someone wounded is beyond stressful. I knew I'd been training for this. I knew this was what I wanted, but it felt so different. This was a real patient, with real injuries. We could smell the blood when we rolled the body over. We did everything we were trained to do. Snapped on gloves, did the blood sweep tried to get the soldier to talk so we'd know if his airway was compromised. I didn't think it was because the claw marks on his face didn't reach his throat. But you still have to check, because things can change ridiculously fast, especially in the field. Besides the face, there were defensive wounds on his forearms. Thorax seemed okay, and we didn't need to intubate. I was in the kind of haze where I knew exactly what to do, exactly what to use to help. My partner and I had been working together so much that we moved like one unit. Assess, triage, treat, tourniquet the arm, pack the gashes with hemostatic material. What did this to him? It was a question I didn't really ask myself until later. Plenty of stuff had claws out there. Mountain lions? I didn't think there were wolves or bears, but that didn't mean something hadn't wandered through. You don't focus on speculation, though but it wasn't a speculation making the dry brush on the ground crack. There was something out there. Sergeant's rifle was immediately pointed in the direction of the sound. He motioned for us to finish, fast. There was no way a single security point could hold this position safely, even if we were undercover while we worked. Bushes are great for concealing, not for providing anything that will stop a bullet. We were good. We were fast. We started packing the wounded onto a stretcher, and I finally realized that he was one of our other instructors. What had he been doing out here alone? Sergeant yelled for us to get down, and something erupted from the bushes. I say something because I only saw a gray and tan blur before I was on my face in the dirt, covering my patient and clutching my useless rifle. Sergeant screamed. There was a sound like, I don't know, ripping fabric? that sound that a knife makes when it's cutting through raw steak. Then there was an incredible smell of blood, too thick to just be from new wounds. It smelled old, and there was this awful stink of urine. I could have explained all of that away, but I could not explain the growl. It was low, deep, high up. Whatever this thing was, it was not a mountain lion. The dry ground crunched under its weight as it turned, and the growling sounded like it was pointed in our direction. I was not ashamed to admit that I started praying. My battle buddy was doing a little more than that. He'd been fiddling with his two-way radio, and he set it to make that horrible ultrasonic screech that electronics make when you've royally screwed them up. That noise felt like someone took an ice pick to my temple. I can't imagine how that thing felt, but it wasn't good. It yelped and it whined, and it almost sounded like a dog. And then the stink was gone. My buddy kept the noise going while we scrambled over to Sergeant Meadows. We went into medic mode again, going through the protocol. He had gashes to the chest and had been thrown across the clearing. Very different treatment. We did our best. I won't go through the details of the medevac. Both Sarge and our other patients survived. Our class all passed the test, and my battle buddy and I got the highest marks. But nobody including our two wounded, talked about what happened. 
The official statement was that cougars had been sighted on base, and that one had attacked an instructor who'd been setting up for our class's dismounted patrol. I know I was functioning on adrenaline and sleep deprivation, but I know that whatever we encountered was no cougar. What it was is something I'm less sure of, and whether it's still out there, that I'm even less sure of. I'm looking to hear if any of your listeners are from the Appalachian Mountains. There's something out here that you have got to see to believe. I was walking through the woods with my boyfriend a few weeks ago, and he was doing that thing he does that I hate, which is walk so fast that I can barely keep up. Pet peeve of mine. Also, I was getting winded, and this was not what I was thinking when I had said I wanted us to go on a day hike. I was thinking a pleasant afternoon, kind of romantic, but he was turning it into a forced march, and I was getting frustrated. A few times I had to call out to him to wait up, and he just would stand there looking all impatient. Anyway, I was getting really ticked off, so I decided just to teach him a lesson. The trail was winding around, and he was getting further and further ahead of me, and when it rounded a corner, he just disappeared from sight, like he didn't even care that he was so far off in front. So I just thought, to hell with him, I'll give him some reason to worry, and then maybe he won't do it again. So I went off trail. Now, I'm not stupid, I know you can get lost easily, but I was irritated and I was wanting to prove a point. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm keeping my ears peeled, thinking I'll hear him start calling my name any minute. I walked for like 10 minutes, trying not to go too far from the trail. I just kind of walked parallel to it. Also, as I'm writing this, I'm seeing this whole thing in a new light, and boy, do I sound dumb. Like one of those girls in a horror movie who you know is going to get targeted by the killer. So then I had to stop and pee, so I went behind a big tree even though I wasn't visible to the trail, but habit, I guess. While I was squatting there, I heard this rustling up above me, and at first I thought it was just squirrels or something, but then I had this weird feeling like somebody was watching me. It freaked me out, especially because I was in this vulnerable position, and so I quickly got my pants pulled up and I started walking again, and I kept looking behind me, thinking somebody was following me. Just a weird feeling but my body must have known something because the hair on my arms was standing up. At first I told myself I had imagined it, and then I started wondering if it was just my boyfriend and that maybe he was going to jump out at me and teach me a lesson. I hate that, by the way, when somebody scares you for a laugh. I stopped at one point and I talked into the woods behind me saying, Okay, Brian, I hear you. And then I waited, but he didn't come out. The longer I looked at the woods behind me, the more uneasy I was getting. So I started walking again. I was really disappointed that I wasn't hearing Brian yelling my name. I mean, did he not even notice that I was gone? Or did he just not care? My brain was taking me in all the directions. I then stopped to listen again, thinking he had gotten far away when I heard this noise above me. A crackling of branches and leaves swishing. That kind of a sound. I got a little nervous because it sounded too big to be squirrels or anything else that you would normally find in a tree. It sounded big, and I had just decided to turn around and start reversing my path back to the main trail when I heard a cough, a human cough. No mistaking it, but it came from above. I looked up into the branches of this big oak tree, one of those ancient ones, and at first I didn't see anything, but all of a sudden I saw movement, and I saw him, at least parts of him. It was a man, but he looked odd, like really hairy. Now I'm not talking about Bigfoot kind of hairy, this was just a really hairy guy, with an overgrown beard and long, shaggy hair. The skin on his face looked similar to a dark tan, I guess, with facial hair covering most of it. It was the fact that he was up in a tree, way off the trail watching me, that completely freaked me out. I looked up at him and I yelled, stay away. I was thinking that this was the creep that had watched me pee a few minutes ago when I heard that noise. But that didn't really make sense because that incident had happened about 20 yards back. And I don't think people can move from tree to tree like monkeys like that. Right after I yelled, the guy jumped down to a lower limb like he was coming for me. His eyes were focused on me 
and he didn't even need to be careful or look around as he came down. No, all eyes were on me. I lost my cool and I just ran like hell back in the direction that I had come. I was frantic, trying to run as fast as I could, but I had to swerve quickly a few times when I realized that I had taken the wrong way. Next, I heard a thud behind me and I started praying, but a second later, the guy grabbed me from behind, one arm in a headlock and his other arm around my shoulders and chest. I started screaming my head off and I grabbed at his arm, scratching and trying to pull him off of me. His arm was weird looking, and that frightened me even more, even more than I had already been. He was super muscular, and he had this really dry skin on his hands, but it was all wrinkled like a raisin. His arm was hairy all the way down to his wrist, too. I didn't turn around to see his face, but I have to tell you, he had the worst smell of any living creature that I have ever experienced. I'm screaming my head off, and he's trying to drag me over to a tree, and he's winning. Suddenly, I hear my boyfriend. Thank God. He was calling my name frantically. He sounded pretty close, but he couldn't see me. And that's when the hairy man let me go. I yelled, here! And I swung around, trying to see where Brian was. I then watched as the man just leapt up into the tree, almost running straight up the trunk. It was supernatural, almost. Super fast. Looking like he did it all the time. But I wasted no time running towards Brian's voice, and I didn't stick around to see where the guy went. Brian was there in a clearing, and I ran straight into his arms, shaking like crazy. I blubbered out my whole story, and he held me. I was shaking so hard. Once he understood what I was telling him, he got all tense, looked around like he wanted to find that guy. But I begged him for us to just leave, and he finally said okay. But he made us stop at the local police department to report it. They acted like I was a wacko when I told them that the guy was in the trees out there. But they took my report, and then we just went home. Okay, so all of you out there, what the hell was this thing? I'm telling you it was not a creature like Bigfoot. It was definitely a man, but a man who climbed the trees like a monkey. In the mid-2000s, I decided to join the army. I guess at the time I thought it would be some kind of a grand adventure. I managed to make it through basic training and advanced individual training. I'm not going to lie, though, it really kicked my butt. But I managed to get through it and I got sent to my first duty station. It was at the National Training Center for Pre-Deployment Training. I was issued supplies and a room and I tried to get myself settled in, but it wasn't an easy transition, and I felt uncomfortable there. The place just didn't seem right to me. I got into my room, and the first few nights were just strange. There was a weird energy there, and bizarre stuff kept happening. For example, my gear kept getting moved around. I'd find my things in the most random places, and the lights would often turn themselves on in the middle of the night, and I kept hearing weird groaning noises, stuff like that. I had been alone there for the first few days, but my roommate showed up at the end of the week. We had known each other during basic training, so it was nice to have somebody familiar around. I told him that I felt like somebody was messing around with me, and I warned him to watch his stuff. The first night he was there, we secured our room and our belongings, and we went to sleep. We had to be up at 5.30 for physical training, but at around one in the morning, I woke up because my blanket had fallen off the bed. I was freezing, which was bizarre because we were in the South and it was the summer, so it's always hot. So I got down to get my blanket and I glanced over to notice that my wardrobe doors were open. I went and I closed them and then got back into bed. I fell asleep again, but then not much later, something woke me up again. I sat up and now saw that all my stuff, and also my roommate's stuff, had been tossed around the room. I woke up my roommate, and he was really irritated. Anyway, we got our stuff picked up, and I went back to bed, but I got woken up yet again, and now it felt like we weren't alone. Luckily, I could hear my roommate snoring, so I knew he was in his bed, where he should be. But that's when I saw the light from the fridge in the kitchenette shining into the room. 
I could also see that somebody had the fridge door open and they were looking inside. It was a soldier, and now it was freezing again. I was about to call out to the soldier, but that's when I watched as he turned around. And it took a minute for my eyes to adjust to the light, but then I started to recognize the gear that he had on. He was loaded up with combat gear and wearing fatigues and boots. I mean, he looked ready for war. When I looked at his face, he slowly turned it in the other direction, and I was shocked at what I saw. Half of his head and helmet were gone, like they had been blown off. I was petrified at that point, but I watched as he closed the fridge and walked across the room to the door and walked out. I was at a complete loss for words. Obviously, that couldn't have been real. I knew that it was a dream, but my mind was racing and I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I didn't even wake my roommate up. It was all too bizarre. I showed up to PT and the acting first sergeant could tell that I wasn't myself. He actually said, you look like you've seen a ghost. I almost broke my concentration and told him what had happened, but I contained myself and I told him that I was fine. But then about halfway through PT, he came up to me again and asked what was going on. I guess I wasn't hiding it as well as I thought I was. I told him I just hadn't been able to sleep that night. But then after PT ended, he pulled me out and said that I should just speak up and whatever I said would be off the record. I told him that if I told him what happened, he would think I was crazy. He told me again that I should trust him, and he assured me that it would be off the record. I started telling him what happened, but when I got to the part about the soldier's head being half blown off, his face got pale, and he was quiet. He said, who put you up to this? Do you think this is funny? For some reason, he was really put off by my story, and my impression was that he thought I was trying to put one over on him. But I had no idea what he was talking about. Put me up to this? I asked. I swore to him that I wasn't lying and that I had seen this apparition, and that it had completely freaked me out. And then he told me to follow him. He took me to the command office where I had never been. He unlocked a door in the back, and I followed him into a room where the commander's desk was. There were some portraits on the wall, and he pointed to one. It immediately gave me chills. Plain as day, I was looking at a portrait of the soldier I had seen. I just said, that's him. The sergeant told me who he was. He was a corporal in the unit's first deployment to Iraq. He had died in an IED attack that took off part of his head. Apparently, I was the first soldier to be assigned the room I was in since it had belonged to the deceased corporal. I was floored. I didn't know what to say. The sergeant then told me stories about who that soldier was and how well-liked he had been. I think at that moment I completely realized how tragic war really is. I deployed with that unit a few months later, and I spent a year fighting in that horrible place. I had some really close calls, and each one of them made me think of that corporal. I've survived more things than most people can imagine, and obviously I managed to make it home, but I don't take anything for granted anymore. I was a county sheriff for a small town in Ohio when this happened. In total, I was there for a couple of years before finding another position closer to my parents' house. They were getting older, and I wanted to be closer to home. At least, that's what I told everybody when I moved away. The reality of it was that I was moving because of an experience I had had on the job in May of 2008. I was called to a home regarding a complaint about some neighborhood kids. I didn't know the details, but I wasn't worried. This type of thing happens all the time, especially in smaller towns where kids don't have that much to do. Sometimes there's property damage that we need to report, but for the most part, it's just harmless pranks. I had a name, an address, and a message about crazy, evil, demon children, but that was it. A woman answered the door when I arrived at the house. I guessed her... I would guess her to be in her mid-sixties. She was a nice lady, seemed normal enough at our first interaction, but she was terrified to go outside. 
She asked me to remove my sunglasses before she let me through the door, and I couldn't understand why until later. She told me that three kids had come to her door last night, all dressed up in old clothes, like they were Amish or something. She said that they pounded on her front door and claimed that they needed help. Their story was that they were lost and that they needed to use her phone. Of course, she opened the door, but the kids all just stood there with their eyes down, staring at their feet. They repeated their plea that they were lost and they needed to use the phone. She asked the kids where they were from, but they didn't answer. They just kept repeating that they were lost and they needed the phone. And then they asked if they could come inside. The woman told me it was then that she knew something was wrong. She didn't say how she knew, but she knew that she couldn't let them in. She said that she offered to bring her phone out to the porch for them to use, but then they said that they were cold and could they please come inside. The woman again said no, and when she went to close the door, all three kids looked up at her. She claimed that it was at that point that she realized they all had black eyes. Not just black irises, but the whole eye was completely black. She slammed her front door and locked it, but she said that as soon as she turned the lock on the door, there was instantly pounding on the back door. She looked across her house, and there were the kids knocking at her back door. She said there was no way they could have gotten there that fast when just a moment earlier they were at the front of her house. She ran to the back door and locked it before they could get in. She then went around to every window in the house, locking and pulling the shades. She then said that she ended up locking herself in her bedroom all night, saying that there was periodic knocking at her windows and her doors all throughout the night. But she, was way, but she was way too terrified to get up and look. I took her story down exactly as she told it, regardless of how ridiculous it sounded. She was convinced that the kids were some evil creatures from hell, but I reassured her that it was most likely a very elaborate prank. It wouldn't be too hard for kids to go to a costume shop and pick up some outfits and black contacts for a prank night. I advised her to look into getting a home I advised her to look into getting a home security system and some cameras if it would make her feel better. At least she could have some peace of mind. There wasn't much else I could do. I didn't think much about the creepy kids until later that night when I stopped at a gas station to pick up a bottle of water and a few snacks. The gas station was pretty quiet but that wasn't unusual for that part of town. Then as I got back to my car and closed the door, there was a knock at my window. It was a child, maybe nine or ten years old at the most, dressed in what looked like old Victorian-era clothes. I thought, great, I have a lead on the pranksters. But then when I rolled down my window, I felt this overwhelming sense of dread. I knew instantly something was wrong. The kid said that he was lost and asked if he could get in my car. My heart jumped in my throat. It was as if my body had sensed the evil. I didn't know what this thing was, this so-called child, but I knew it wasn't human. I asked the kid for his name and where he lived, but he just kept repeating that he was lost and asking to come into my car. It was almost like he didn't know how to say anything else. I told him he couldn't come in, but I could call his parents for him. And then he looked up at me with eyes black as night, and without changing the look on his face, he turned and walked off into the forest on the opposite side of the road. Once he reached the trees, he seemingly disappeared into thin air. I didn't try to follow him, I just knew that that would not end well, and I didn't want to find out exactly what that meant. Hi, Lilith. I've been a follower of your channel for a long time and have always loved your stories. I just never thought that I would have a story of my own to share, until now. This incident happened the other night. I work the front desk at a small-town medical clinic in western Maryland. Most of our patients are locals who sprain the occasional ankle or smash a thumb with a hammer. We hardly get any outsiders in town. 
The few who do are typically going to or coming from the nearby Savage River State Forest. I usually work the day shift from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., but the overnight girl had just gotten married, and her and her new husband were on a honeymoon for two weeks. The clinic asked me to cover her shift, and since I didn't really have any good reasons not to, I agreed. The clinic was run by a doctor who lived in an attached home to the clinic. If there was ever a real emergency, we were instructed to call her into the clinic. Otherwise, the patient could just see one of the few nurses who were on the payroll. Usually there were only four or five people in the clinic at a time and only two at night. I had never actually had to call the doctor in for an emergency until the other night. This night had been as quiet as the rest of them at first. It was only me and the one nurse who was hanging out with me at the desk. She was watching something on her phone, some weird show about people getting married at first sight or something, when somebody burst through the front door. It was two Maryland state troopers, and between them they were dragging a man who was bleeding profusely from multiple wounds across his body. I was too stunned to say anything, but the nurse who was with me was both rushing to help the officers and reprimanding them for dragging the poor guy. As the three of them carried the man into the back, the nurse told me that I needed to call the doctor right away. I was a little nervous at this. The doctor was always nice enough to me, but something about her always made me feel a little intimidated. I knew she had spent six years in the army, and there was even an office rumor that she was still connected to the military. I called her number twice, but I never got an answer. I could hear commotion coming from the others in the back, so I threw my jacket on and I ran outside, next door to the doctor's house. I banged on the door sharply and I was caught off guard when the door almost immediately opened. The doctor was there, fully dressed and ready to go. She hardly greeted me as she walked past me, heading straight to the clinic, so I just followed her back next door and into the waiting room. The doctor immediately walked to the back of the clinic, and I went to one of the supply rooms to try to find something to clean up the blood near the front door. I found some gloves and disinfectant, and I was scrubbing hard when the doctor walked back in about two minutes later. When she saw me cleaning the blood, she told me to stop immediately and to leave it alone, that she would take care of it herself later. I started to protest. The idea of the doctor having to clean up that mess was absurd. But before I could say so, she held up her hand to stop me. And I remember what she said next with chilling clarity. Lock the door, she said. Lock it. Turn off all the lights in the front room and get behind the desk, out of sight. If anybody comes to the door, you are not to let them in. Not for any reason. Do you understand me? I guess I must have shown some sign of agreement because after that, she just turned and returned to the back room. I was absolutely dumbfounded. I had no idea what she was talking about or why she would say any of that stuff. And I was pretty unnerved at that point. I ran around turning off the lights and locking the deadbolt on the front door. I ran back behind the desk and I crawled underneath it. My heart was racing and it was hard to keep my breathing steady. The clinic wasn't really big, but I hadn't seen the other nurse or either of the officers since they took the injured guy into the back room. I sat for what felt like an hour under the desk when a sudden banging on the front door scared the crap out of me. I almost got up to see who it was until I remembered what the doctor had said. I thought about peeking over the counter to see who it could be, but then I thought better of it. And honestly, I was too afraid to look anyway. At first, it seemed like the banging was coming from a single person. But after a few moments, it sounded like two, and then three until ultimately it sounded like half of the town was out there just banging on the glass doors. I was terrified, sitting crouched down with my head tucked between my legs. There were no voices or demands to be let inside, just rapid rhythmic banging. Nobody from the back came out, and I sat alone in the receptionist room, just waiting for the thunderous pounding at the door to break the glass. I can't tell you how long it went on for. At one point, I was certain I was losing my sanity when it just stopped. One moment, it was absolute turmoil, and the next, complete silence. The new stillness was more unsettling than the pounding had been, to be honest. 
Only a few minutes later, there was another knock at the door, and I felt a pang of fear, thinking that whoever was out there had returned. But this time, I could hear voices on the other side. I was working up the courage to actually look this time when the doctor came bounding down the hallway to the front door. She unlocked it and threw it open. A stream of men rushed in, probably a dozen, all dressed in a type of military uniform that I couldn't recognize. A few were carrying what looked like medical instruments, while others were carrying assault rifles. It was chaotic, and I found myself being gently escorted outside into the back of a black SUV. Two men sat in the front seat, and another sat next to me in the back, all dressed in the same military fatigues I had seen the other men wearing. The man sitting next to me in the back asked me to explain the night's events, and I did. At least the parts I could, anyway. He asked me a few questions, mostly about the pounding noise that I heard. I could tell he was trying to hide it, but when I told him it sounded like literally dozens of people, he became very concerned. Almost frightened. When I was done, he thanked me politely and told the man at the wheel to drive me home. And he did. I never did give my address, but somehow they knew where my house was anyway. The next day, I received a visit at home from the man who had questioned me. He told me that the injured man had contracted a rare and infectious disease, and that everyone who had come into physical contact with him needed to be quarantined. The pounding I heard was a delusion brought on by the stress, and that I would soon receive a call from someone with the Department of Health with information on my indefinite paid leave of absence. And that was it. I haven't seen the doctor, the nurse, the injured man, or the officer since. And just like the man said, I received a call from somebody who claimed to be from the Department of Health. I've been placed on an indefinite leave of absence with full pay. The only restriction being that I don't discuss the incident with anybody. Hi, Lilith. I started listening to your channel accidentally a few weeks ago when I was looking for something else. But after hearing some of these stories, I just kept listening. And now I've decided to share something that I've experienced. It's kind of a relief telling somebody because at the time it happened, I was really questioning what I heard and feeling like I should just be quiet about it. When I was in the Army, I spent a couple of years working at a military hospital. I had always intended on going into medicine, but at the time I only took the training for patient administration. Things were typically pretty low-key around there, and much of the time it just felt like an office job. I was stationed in San Antonio and was assigned to mostly work under one particular surgeon. There were times when I had to stay after hours to catch up on paperwork, and there were even a few times that I went in really late at night to catch up on things. I had a real insomnia problem at the time. I will admit, though, that it did feel creepy to be at the hospital late at night. Mainly the side of the hospital that I was on with the offices was especially quiet. There would be an occasional nurse or security guard come through, but that was few and far between. On the night that this all happened, I had gone over around midnight. It was November, and it was cold and snowy, and when I got to the hospital, I walked to the office area but entered through the back door that's reserved just for staff. The front receptionist door was locked since the offices were closed. So I went in and I walked to my desk, which incidentally was all the way by the front receptionist door, but like I said, that door was locked. Everything seemed normal, kind of creepy, but that was usual for that time of night. And so, like every other time I was there late, I turned on a podcast and I got to work. Notably though, since nobody was there, I wasn't using headphones. About an hour in, I thought I heard footsteps mixed in with my podcast. I paused it to see if it was part of the recording or if they were in the building with me, and sure enough, I still heard the footsteps. My first thought was that it was a security guard. They didn't usually come into the office area, but there are glass doors in the front, and they could have seen my light on and were coming to check it out. So I yelled out, Hello? There was no answer, but the footsteps didn't stop. So I started to walk over to check things out, thinking maybe they didn't hear me. I walked toward the common area in the office. The lights were off since I had never turned them on. I only turned on the light by the back door and the light by my desk. 
so the switches were right beside me. I flicked them all on. There was nobody there. But when I turned on the light, very noticeably, the footsteps stopped. I was starting to feel freaked out at this point, and the only thing that made my head not hurt was thinking that maybe one of the doctors had forgotten something. So, leaving the light on, I went and looked around. I didn't see anybody at all. I assumed that I had been imagining things. So eventually, I turned the lights off and I went back to work. But it wasn't even five minutes later when I heard the footsteps again. At this point, curiosity and adrenaline made me want to find out exactly what was going on. I also started to have the thought that it could be someone up to no good, and I should intervene. So I went back out to the common area, but this time I was really quiet and I didn't turn the lights on. I walked toward the direction of the footsteps, and as I approached, they stopped. I stood still for a moment, and then I heard the footsteps again, this time back by the office where I had just been working. So I walked there as silently as I could. The same thing happened. The footsteps stopped as I approached. I called out in a normal voice, but it sounded like I was yelling since it was dead quiet. Is there somebody here? What's going on? At that point, the door to the surgeon's office, which was right behind me, slammed open and closed. Now that is strange enough to be horrifying, but especially so because that door was always locked. I immediately started to feel this overwhelming sense of doom, and right then the temperature in the room dropped drastically, and at the same time, out of my peripheral vision, I saw a figure flash by with the sound of running footsteps. The sound passed right next to me, and I caught a smell of something like gunpowder, and then the sound and the smell became fainter and fainter. I was petrified. I had been there countless times at night, and I had never encountered anything like this. I made myself go over and look in the office of the surgeon. The door was unlocked, even though I had checked it out as being locked twice before. When I turned on the light, I saw glass shattered on the floor by the desk. It was a framed picture of the surgeon's family. Nothing else in the room looked to be disturbed. I instantly turned around and left the building. When I went outside, it was still snowing, and yet there was no sign of any footprints leaving the building. I couldn't drive away fast enough. That ice-cold fear that I had felt was indescribable. I never even said anything to anybody about it. Every time I tried to imagine telling someone, I thought for sure I would just sound like I was nuts. After that, I did stay late at the hospital a few times, but only if I wasn't alone. Back in 2008, with the economic turndown, I lost my job. The job I'd had in finance got completely upended. I knew I'd need to reinvent myself, and I even went back to live with my parents in Utah while I figured things out. I ended up going in a completely different direction and enrolling in a police academy. I appreciated being able to move back home for a while, and it was mutually beneficial since I was able to help my mom and dad out a lot around the house while I was in training. They also said it made them feel safer than ever. On my end, the field training that I was taking created an awareness that I had never had before. My parents' house was on a secluded private drive. It's a two-story house with a walkout basement. During the time that this all happened, they had left town for a few weeks to visit my sister in another state. I was taking care of the house and their dog, Henry. He was a collie mix and the most obedient and sweetest dog ever. During that time, I was also studying for the POST, which stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. It requires a written test as a part of the preparation for the officer selection process. It's similar to college entrance exams like the ACT or the SAT. So I've been studying a lot for it and had invited my fellow cadet Nick over so that we could work together one evening. It was getting dark. Henry the dog was in the living room with us and he was sleeping when he suddenly jumped up and he looked out the window, growling. I had never heard him make noises like that before. His hair was up from his neck to the base of his tail. So I looked out the window, but I couldn't see anything. And so I closed the window and the curtain. It was a bit unusual to see Henry acting so strangely. Nick was wondering if he had heard a coyote or something. I went and checked the locks with Henry following me. 
I knew that the closest neighbors were also out of town. Their house was just on the other side of a few larger trees, so I felt pretty alone up there sometimes. Henry calmed back down and went to lay on the rug, so I calmed down too. I figured if he was relaxed, everything was probably fine. Nick and I were quizzing each other from the practice test when suddenly Henry went crazy again. He was growling and snarling viciously, which was totally out of character for him. I turned out the lights and I looked out the living room window, but I didn't see anything on that side of the house either. I wanted to get a good look out the back of the house, but to do that I would have to go downstairs, but Henry would not follow me. So then I decided to go look out from the back deck. It was a high deck that didn't have any stairs off of it, so I figured that I would be safe. I turned off all the lights and the outdoor floodlights so that I could get some night vision. And then I slowly opened the door and I went out on the deck. It was quiet outside. The driveway was empty and the area by the shed was clear. But still, it felt creepy out there. And I had a strong urge to go back inside. But first I made myself go over to the side of the deck to look out in the direction of the neighbor's house. They did have their outdoor lights on, and under their deck I spotted a moving shadow. It looked tall, and at first I thought it was a man standing by the deck support. I crept further out from under the deck, and I just gasped. It had to be seven feet tall, and it was no man. It continued to come closer to me, and soon I could see that it was staring right at me as it approached and entered the light of the house next door. All I could focus on was its eyes. It's freaky eyes. I feel nervous even just writing this. It felt like evil was looking at me. It looked grayish. It was naked and pale and gaunt looking. I could see its ribs straining against its skin. Soon it was right below the deck where I was standing and it was crouched down on all fours. I got so creeped out. I had this feeling that if it wanted to, it would be able to spring all the way up onto the deck. It kept looking at me and hissing and clicking, and then it sprinted away into the trees faster than I would have ever believed it could have moved. I ran back into the house, locked the door. I grabbed the dog, yelled at Nick to follow me down the hallway to my dad's study. I locked the door to keep us inside and took two guns out of the gun safe and loaded them. Nick was freaked out because I wasn't saying anything, just loading guns that he didn't even know we had or that I knew how to use. So then I positioned myself and I watched out the window with my loaded pistol while I tried to explain to Nick what I had seen. I couldn't even tell if I was making any sense as I talked. I told Nick to call the precinct and to get somebody out there. He was reluctant because I think he thought I was going crazy, but he did it and the precinct sent a squad car. We stayed locked in that room until the police arrived. By the time they did, Henry had calmed down, so I was really hoping that that thing had gone. The officers came and did a whole sweep of the outside area, even over at the neighbors, and they looked for signs of anything unusual, but didn't find anything. I didn't back down from my story, though. That thing was real, and I could tell that it was dangerous. I think they believed me. I mean, I wasn't known as a flaky person, but there wasn't much they could do. This story still freaks me out so much, even though I never did see that thing again. Whatever it was, could be anywhere, and I don't want to meet it alone or unarmed. Hey Lilith, a week or two ago I heard a story on your channel about a creature I recognized. It's something I've witnessed myself in New Mexico. For a while I thought I might be insane or hallucinating, but now I know I'm not. I own a decent-sized ranch in the northwestern part of the state. I have a few hundred head of cattle and twice as many chickens, one of the last true ranchers left in the area. I inherited the property from my father, and he inherited it from his, going all the way back to the early 1900s, before New Mexico was even a state. Even way back then, there were stories of monsters and demons living in the desert. Heck, everybody's heard of the chupacabra, but I never paid any of it any mind, thinking that it was all just a bunch of crap. Well, my opinion has changed. You see, about a month ago, some pretty nasty things started happening out in the area. A man that I was good friends with discovered three of his dogs torn apart at the edge of his property. 
Those dogs were tough, mixed breeds, too. He used them for elk hunting up north. Whatever killed those poor pups sure wasn't a coyote. I kept my own dog, Cruiser, close to my side after that. And then a few nights later, we had our own incident. It was late in the evening, and the sun had just gone down. I was in Albuquerque all day and had gotten back late, but I still had a few things to take care of before going to sleep. And that's when I heard a commotion coming from the hen house. Sometimes a coyote would come sniffing around and occasionally manage to finagle its way into the hen house, usually at the loss of one or two of the hens. But as I ran up to the building, I could hear an extreme disturbance coming from inside and the sounds of hundreds of chickens going berserk. As I threw open the door, I could tell something was seriously wrong. Every hen in the building, about 400 of them, were in an extreme state of panic. I heard the sound of wrenching metal coming from the far side of the building, and I ran to investigate. I was greeted with a scene of chaos. A huge gaping hole had been torn into the side of the house, like something sharp had just sheared through the sheet metal, creating a ten-foot-wide gap. Dozens of hens had been torn to pieces. Chicken wire, wood, and feathers were all there in a bloody, twisted mess. Now, I'm a rancher. Raising and slaughtering animals for food is part of what I do, and agree or disagree, it's a vital component of this country's way of life. But even my heart broke a little at the way these poor girls had perished. Wasteful and needless. Whatever had perpetrated this had done so for the sake of just taking lives. We fixed up the damage as best we could, and I asked a few of my hands to stay in our guest house for a few days until whatever this was blew over. I wish that had been the end of it, but there was one last incident. A few nights afterwards, sometime in the middle of the night, I was woken by my wife shaking me violently. She said that Cruiser, who was sleeping at the foot of the bed, had jumped up snarling and took off out of the room and down the stairs. We had a doggy door for Cruiser. He was used to being his own dog, and he was outside right now, barking up a storm at something out there in the darkness. Cruiser was a clever dog and well-trained. If he was alarmed, then it was for a good reason. More importantly, he was my closest and most loyal companion these last 12 years, and I'll be damned if he was going to face whatever he was out there facing alone. Hardly stopping to think, I grabbed my 12-gauge from beside my bed, and like a fool, I ran out into the New Mexico night, with no shoes, no light, and no idea what I was going up against. Before I had made it outside, Cruiser's barking had stopped short. I ran out onto the front porch, and I couldn't see him anywhere. The immediate area was illuminated by lights from the house, but beyond that was complete darkness. I ran to the perimeter of the light, yelling, Cruiser, repeatedly, in a near state of panic. Suddenly I heard his barking again, and this time it was way out in the darkness. I took off, heading straight for the barking, gravel and stones cutting into the bare skin on my feet. When I got to the spot where I thought I heard Cruiser, I heard his barking again, coming from a different direction. I ran towards it, but before I could reach him, again, the noise changed directions. Another two or three times this happened, each time taking me further and further from the fading lights of the house. I sat, panting in the darkness, and I knew that something was very wrong. Cruiser hadn't barked in several minutes now, and I wasn't completely sure which direction led back to the house. As I was trying to catch my breath and consider my options, I heard something slinking around just outside my field of vision. And then the most absolute horrifying moment of my life occurred. From right behind me, not ten feet away, came a human scream. It was my voice, me, screaming cruiser, exactly as I had been doing for the last ten minutes. I turned, raising my shotgun to fire. In the instant before pulling the trigger, I could make out a black shape at least ten feet high. The area around it seemed brighter in comparison as if it pulled the darkness into itself. I fired, and in the brief muzzle flash I saw something shooting straight for my head. I felt an impact, and then nothing. One of my field hands found me laying out there in the dark about a quarter mile away from the house. It was a feat of luck that he did, for even a group of six men could have easily passed me by in the dark. 
I was still out of it, and they carried me back to the house and laid me down. The next day I woke up to a bad gash on my head and even worse news. My man who had found me told me that my wife had called them when I ran out into the night. When they came looking for me, they heard my shotgun blast and they followed the noise. He said there was nothing in the area where they found me, except for a pool of thick black liquid leading to a spatter trail going off into the desert. They also found Cruiser, huddled under a bush not too far away from my house, completely on the opposite side of where I had been looking. They could barely get him out from under, and he's still not a hundred percent relaxed again. By the grace of God, nothing else has happened since, though it's only been two weeks. I've asked two of my hands to move onto the property permanently, and I contracted a security company to install a dozen-plus security cameras around the ranch. I can confirm that there is something deadly out in the New Mexican desert. Call it a chupacabra, or a demon, or whatever. I don't care. All I know is that it's not just an animal hunting for food. It's evil. It toys with its prey, and it kills just for sport. Just be careful out there.